And like I said, we'll play a much shorter piece uh, at the end to give him the last word. So do we have a, uh, oh, to, just to begin, where you can use either one of these mics. Um, I don't know if we can, if it's really a good idea to have them both on at the same time. So, you know, I know you can't see exactly what I'm doing, but there's a little gray button here to turn this on. Uh, and on the top of the microphone here, there's also a button to turn it on and off. So just decide what you want to do. And if you don't want to stand in front of the stand, you want to take it off the stand, that's fine too. You just have to hold this mic pretty close to your mouth if you use it. So do we have a first uh, first taker for the open mic? Okay. And uh, please, when you come up, since we're not using the list, uh, tell us a little something about yourself, but make sure you tell us what your name is, please. Hi there, I'm Charmaine, and um, I'm going to be presenting, um, this is my first time reading out loud anything I write, Yay. and I carry a notebook with me everywhere, and um, so I'm going to be presenting on a gentleman I met online, we knew each other for three weeks, he swooned me with poetry and so on. And we took a leap of faith, and I invited him in, into my home in 2011. And so uh, my writing is called Remembering You 2011. January all seemed to be swell. We met, our hearts melt. Second weekend on the stage, drunkenness and rage. Awaken the true spirit of you, of me, and I started to discover wrong choices I made. As you only cared about another song, drink, harp, Note, howl at the moon. February came and a deep breath I took. Another chance for us to dance. Fall in love, love a dove. Roses, chocolates, and cards so sweet. Turned bittersweet, the next drink we took. Enthralled to argument. Seth runs away to wander the coop streets, seeing what type of people he would meet. March arrives and we still don't jive. Drunkenness again reveals the demons inside. Seth takes flight into the night. Char loses sight. Sleep, employment, security, she knows no more. He finds a girl in the park, stolen whiskey, drink beers on the porch, causing turmoil evermore. April reminds me of the fool in love. I am with this turtle dove. He tears my heart apart. He tears his clothes in two, reminders of his abandonment issues, telling me of my faults while he bolts. May Day has come. Char no longer has to run. Her home, her own. Employment serves the soul. Money worries seen no more. Our communications swirl, enabling all the rules he promises to follow. I wobble back to Seattle, thinking we conquered this battle. June bug starts to flutter. Here we go again as I get thrown in the gutter. While he stews in the house with bruise, my fears escalate as a new job awaits. I realize I need to break free. He leaves upon my release back on the streets. My home, my own sheets. July is for independence. The courts restrain me from dependence on him or him on me. I cash in my chips. We are separated by video clips. Our love struggles through the distance. Neither can move or resist. Can't find a better man. August arrives, still having stars in our eyes. I buy a new guitar to call ours. His 50th birthday, long weekend. I drive to Seattle to get him. Give to him baby. Fall in love all over again. Home we go, baby in the back seat. He drunk on the ride, sleeping while I drive. September is to remember, almost bliss with every kiss. Old habits die hard, hearts in love never want to part. We work at love as an art. Baby our band, Dio his song. Drunkenness continues to be the venue. November brings on the fall. He breaks baby after all. Over my head, guitar sheds bruises, everybody loses, turkey dinner alone, crying at cronies about the chronic drunk. I thought I loved, choices, the stranger says, go through my head. I continue to share my bed. December holidays in throttle, every day us hitting the bottle. Pace, not a race, he says, yet always taste liquor on his tongue. It never takes too long. We decorate the home for gnomes of the holiday, slumber party, sleeping on the floor, drinking our gift forevermore. The new year, 2012, believes that all is well. Arrive home on one year, anniversary, his cursing, violence, 9-11, yet again, he is gone. Making a toast, vowing I will never love, alone. Thank you.
How does that feel? Good. Good? Yeah. A little nervous, but good. One of the things I like about the open mic format, too, is that once you have a chance to get up and do it, you learn that you will not die as a result. That's right. Yes. So she's still with us, see? And she's okay. Uh, who would like to share something next? Oh, wow. Three people at once. Can I, is it okay if I go in, in this order? Like, boom, boom, boom. Will that work for everybody? Okay. So come on up and tell us who you are. I am a poet. <laughs> this is a poem called Salty. In my head you are flying around like a god. In my sight I see a man whose eyes see nothing but my beauty. In my heart I feel residual pain, but also the promise of real love. My eyes are red from tears. My lips moist as I taste the flavor of sadness. Salty. How strange that sadness tastes of salt. No wonder why the savory brings me comfort. It's the one flavor I've tasted my entire life. Thank you, I have one more. This is called The Last Time. I stay silent in these last moments with you. Only the sound of our breath and the movement of our bodies. Each motion I capture, each kiss, its own single expression of passion. I let myself fall slightly in love with you, let myself go knowing this is done. I want to know completely how making love to you feels. You move slowly so I can feel every last minute with you inside. You stay close, let me touch your body as my fingertips press firmly into your skin. I want to stay in this place forever, make you never want to move away from me. We both know this is the end. No more words of regret. No more words of regret. No more let's see what happens. Just you leaning into me, your hands cradle my face as you kiss me goodbye. Just one more, let me get this loaded up here on my laptop. So I am not a poet. I am really more of like just like writing science fiction and fantasy and stuff like that. This is an excerpt of what I have written. My name is Jacob, by the way. I forgot to introduce myself. I have horrible manners. I'm sorry. <laughs> so this story is just basically based on some of the experiences that I have had. So I decided to put this in one character. And so I'm going to read the intro and just a little bit of this first chapter. I never asked anyone to be who I am. It just happened, you know? I mean, I didn't choose the power to see the paranormal time travel, or be able to run faster than a Bugatti. People say I am part of God's plan. Others have different ideas. I mean, if I'm so special, then why are there people trying to kill me, like the Illuminati, for example? Why am I resented by pastors when I proclaim that I can see the dead and talk to them, or resented by other people when I say that I'm a Christian? Am I really that messed up? I mean, this only scratches the, the surface of, of all the problems that I have. Now we all know Uncle Ben's famous line from Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, thank you, Stan Lee. Great responsibility does not begin to describe the crap that I have to put up with. Like, my great destiny is to save the world from global damnation. Now how do I do that? If you want to keep from the rest of my story, keep listening. Chapter 1. My math teacher is the Spawn Satan. Alex McCready! I awoke startled. So the screechy voice of my math teacher and the pain of her ruler blistering my knuckles. Yeah, I attended to one of those schools. Is my teaching getting in the way of your sleeping again, Mr. McCready? Oh, uh... Sorry, Miss Wright, I swear as I wiped the crust from my eyes. Sorry, 
Is that what you had to say about your test score, Mr. McCready? I could hear, ooh, it's coming from the other room. Coming from the parts of the different room, I need to say. Miss Wright turned a piece of paper and placed it on my desk, which was marked F, 56%. Wait a minute, I was looking at the piece of paper. I had every answer right. This is bull crap. Crap, ow! Language, Mr. McCready. Ring. <sighs> Thank goodness, stay by the bell. Class dismissed, Miss Wright announced to the class. She turned, pointed to me, and said, you stay right there. Dang, not quite. As the last student left, the, left, she closed the door. Teachers were not allowed to be by themselves with just one student if the door was closed. Not again, I thought to myself. This is the third time Miss, Miss Wright, this is the third time that Miss Wright, I lose my place, walked the door and started with her usual rant. Three, two, one. And she began. I know your so-called ADHD makes you dumber than a sack of rocks, Miss Wright said with that familiar sound of disgust in her voice. But you need to get your head out of your ass and get your act together. I got all the answers right on that test, I protested. Shut up, you little liar. And I glared at her with rage in my eyes. Miss Wright then looked at the cross I wore around my neck. And you are no longer allowed to wear that in my class. I tightened my jaw. Why? Why? I ho she hollered. Then she grasped at my wrist and yelled, because in this classroom, no, in this school, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am God. Hey, I hollered, let go. My impulses were kicking in, not good. I tried pulling my hand out of hers, but Wright had a grip like iron. Her strong grasp caused the veins in my arm to close, making my arm feel numb. I said, let go. All of a sudden, her hand, all of a sudden there was smoke coming from my wrists. Finally, she did what I demanded her to do. Wright cradled her, her hand in an intent to ease the pain, but that did not seem to like it was working. You burned me! Not knowing exactly what to do in that situation, I stood up, grabbed my backpack, and began to storm out of the room. Where are you going? Wright demanded. I'm not through with you. I'm late for work. If you leave, Wright hollered, you're expelled. That means I don't have to be near you? Huh, <laughs> good. You'll be a failure and your father will have another reason to beat you again. Okay, well that was weird. She didn't know that my father beat me. Only a few people whom I've told know that. I just looked over my shoulder and I said, screw off, and walked out the door. As I was putting on my apron and took my apron and tote for Danny Boy's Cafe where I worked, I looked at the red mark from where Wright squeezed. How did this happen? How was I not burnt? I wondered. I turned around from my locker and saw the owner of the cafe walk in. Good afternoon, Alex. The sound of the owner's voice just made my day a little brighter. I was greeted by his usual happy and father-like smile. He was just so happy to be the pastor of a little church just down the street. I attended as often as I could. Well, you just made mine better, sir, I said. I had such high respect for him, I was scared to call him by his name. <laughs> Jokingly, he said, are you kissing up to me again? Uh, no, I chuckled. How many times do I have to tell you then? You can call me Danny, or... I rolled my eyes while smiling and said, or a dad. This man was like a second dad to me because my first dad, well, that was pretty much explained. I was also dating his daughter. There we go, he chuckled. When Danny shook my hand, I cringed. His smile turned into a look of concern and he pulled back his hand. Oh, I'm sorry, what happened? I don't know, I began to mumble. I, uh... I just kind of hurt my hand. My teacher just had a really good grip. Did you report this? He asked. I stared at him a little dazed. Alex? 
I, uh, I began to mumble. I started to breathe heavily. My vision turned blurry and everything seemed to be hazy. I stumbled forward and it felt like as I slammed right against a brick wall. That was Danny catching me as I fainted. Alex, Alex, Alex. His voice faded as I blacked out. That's all I have right now. My name is April Bullard, and I would like to do The Witch of Gator Tail Salute. Long past the sleepy-eyed town of Dermot, off the banks of Bartholomew Bayou, lies a dreary quagmire where no man owns a lot, the swamp known as Seven Devils Do. The bayou spreads out in thin fingers, a spider's web of aisles and sloughs. Many enter, but no one there lingers, for the swamp can turn hearts that are true. They say there's an aisle in the center, and once found, there's naught you can do. You're trapped, and the currents defend her. The witch of Gator Tail slew. Amidst a circle of bald cypress trees, with fireflies she dances and sings. The tune is alluring and wafts on the breeze. She beckons both beggars and kings. Follow the sound to her dock by the bank. Each plank is etched deeply with runes. The pilings stand firm like soldiers in rank, and candles lead on past the dunes. Notice the pilings, for each has a face, unmoving and locked in the bark. And chained to her dock, they're bound to that place, forever in the mud in the dark. Sweet scented candles ease you into her sphere, treading soft along the pathway of flame. You sight her behind mossy curtains so sheer, but she's the huntress, your only game. Swaying and bending and twirling with ease, she delights in the mystical dance. And before you're aware, you are down on your knees with a kiss you are lost in her trance. Please, take my warning and don't navigate the swamp known as Seven Devils Do. The channel's a maze, the melody the bait, for the witch of Gator Tail Slew. My name is Justin. Uh, I usually write more in a journalistic style, but I have a couple poems, and it's been a long time since I've written a poem. I'm planning to write more soon. <laughs> so this is called Trains Across the Sea. A friend caught me by surprise and handed me the wasteland, a parting gift, then said farewell. This barely registered. I was dazed, addled. The German girl beside me on the train platform made small talk in French, words like falling leaves. I thought numbly of scars and Venetian blinds. Buildings flee on either side of me, familiar but foreign, framed by the sun. I have a vague idea of what lies before and ahead. The German girl took the same train I will be home soon, she smiled. Studies went well, yes. The language came by necessity. Which car is yours? I showed her my ticket, but the words wouldn't come. Is it regret, I feel, or satisfaction? Who sets the standard? Am I fit to judge? Did the day only start when I opened the blinds? Worlds away and only hours gone by. The German girl noticed my preoccupation. I smiled mutely. My eyes apologized. 
She handed back my ticket and stepped onto the train. Alone again, I board, we whistle, we part. I will be mid-flight in 48 hours, Paris below. At midnight, 14 hours ago, I unlocked the gate, crept past the nun's window, and drunkenly ended an era. But in this instant, I was flipping pages of English words I did not understand, and thinking out my window that everything was nothing. The countryside burned, blue haze in its place. Scarf flipping in the wind, a train across the sea. Thanks. I have one more. <laughs> uh, this is called Some Kind of Love. I like to name my poems after songs. My love is a naive love, cute, cuddly, and cruel, that melts wings made of wax, but that I can't won't abandon. Though fleeting glances on the sidewalk and off-handed discussions leave it naked, obscure, imaginary, playing shadow puppets from afar. For hope is tied up with fear, and I fear I can't stop. Hope. Easy enough to watch the clock tick, or catch up with your brother, Sleep outdoors, baseball or a nap with a book in the sunshine. Relaxed, but fear is tied up with hope. And I hope I can't stop. Or I hope I can stop being afraid. Frozen, frightened, inexplicable paralysis. Recurs in thought and action. When put in perspective, shouldn't mean as much as it does, but it does and is, in spite of me, deep, foundational, resistant to will and reason. Thank you. Tony. This is called West of Town, and it's more of a, um, a prose poem, uh, written a little, written more like prose than poetry. West of Town. It's above 50 degrees and bright outside, not at all the February of last year. I still wear mittens, a cap, an oversized turtleneck sweatshirt but leave my jacket in the car. The dog can't contain his excitement after traveling with the back window halfway down and his nose savoring every smell along the five mile drive. Now he paws at the door. He would yell, let me out if he could talk. Some days I think he does talk, but I keep this to myself mostly. We cross the parking lot, already three quarters fill, full on our way to the river view. I must see the water before doing anything else. He pulls me along, forgetting to heal, forgetting to sit. I almost don't care, then remember what I paid for obedience training and feign interest in keeping him alert to my commands. Today, commands seem outlandish. It's much too nice outside to care about rules. Swallowing up as much blue sky as I can and watching the sun dry out, dozens of giant soggy leaves is enough. I'm content with this moment of me, the dog, sky, sun, and crisp freshness all around. Today, I came out of the cave for this left the fire and my blanket, my satellite movies, and microwave popcorn. Today I won't worry about the co cost of gas for an afternoon drive. 
I don't hear the cars race by, or little kids tell parents to pedal faster on the bike trail. I don't hear the young, freckled girl cry into her cell phone, or the big trucks cough up fumes. I don't hear any of it, not today. Today I can see Mount Hood and Mount St. Helens and a tiny bit of Mount Adams. I can smell the pavement warming and imagine dime-sized rain puddles receding under fallen leaves. At first, I hear them far away, then closer, and then I see them, hundreds of geese like dots of peppercorns in the western sky. They are all heading my way all looking and flying in my direction. My heart speeds up. I'm excited and thrilled. I'm ecstatic. I sigh and coo, cough, uh, caught up in this magnificent sight. Then I'm crying, full. I feel full. What a glorious event overhead, free and unexpected loud, alive, all mine. The dog sits, looks up too. We wait for the last formation to pass and turn toward the parking lot. I don't want to go because I don't want the full feeling to leave. As we walk slowly toward the car, the dog automatically heals without a command. I know how much he wants to please me. He can't possibly know that positioning his small furry self right next to my left leg makes the full feeling last much longer. Sometimes the beauty of things is simple. This simple. Thank you. read a couple of poems and then we'll hear from, as I mentioned earlier, we'll hear from Brad again to say goodbye. But let me, I'm going to try to get to the part of the page that that's going to happen on, just so that it'll go faster in a few moments. So this is, uh, for those of you that came in a little bit later, um, John Barber is the person who uh, created uh, Unpublished Writer's Day and then decided to pass it on to me, and um, he spoke earlier today about Richard Browdigan and the Browdigan Library. There's also information about the Browdigan Library on the Clark County Historical Museum site, and also on this website that we're on right now, browdigan.net, which Professor Barber put together, is a really comprehensive website about Browdigan's work. So, uh, as I said, to say goodbye, we're going to hear from Browdigan last. So it wasn't entirely my choice to come to the Pacific Northwest when I first came out here. So uh, this was a time period when I was uh, living and working in New York and very happy to be doing so. And just so when I wrote this poem, uh, I kind of knew I was heading out this way and, and wasn't too happy about it and didn't know what was going to happen, of course. So, and I, I'm choosing to read this to you because um, it mentions Browdigan in it as well. This poem is called A Spiked Baseball Bat for Ward Connerly. The sky is slate gray and it is raining, and a day spent mired in preparation for an article on the dismantling of affirmative action has left me kind of depressed, and I'm sitting on a company bus next to a co-worker who may or may not be aware that she is a lesbian, and I'm reading Richard Browdigan's Revenge of the Lawn, particularly charmed by the stories for his daughter. He is always gentle and sweet and reverent, toward her, and I gaze out the window wondering, is this how it's going to be in Washington? Wondering whether I'll be able to handle it all, or will I succumb to light deprivation anxiety? I don't drink coffee, after all. And Rose is on the bus, and the nervous, disheveled girl who reminds me of Marie Grosso, my first girlfriend in 10th grade, who would not kiss me no matter how far into the woods we went. And I listen to the excited chatter behind me as the bus makes its way down the street, and as we turn the corner, I once again check out a brick wall where someone has painted, J-Love. Taz, short, brown, tiny. 
And we passed Dean's Shoe Shop and JCR Percussion and High Bridge Fashions, now closed. And I wonder about the folks living in these tiny apartments we passed. And just then, I noticed a sliver of blue splashed across the horizon above Yankee Stadium. And the windows on the apartment building light up and twinkle like glitter. And as the green greenery of the oh-so-green trees passes by, I become happy as I nod my head to the tune I have just constructed. But before this new attitude can take hold, I see a blonde-haired girl with one hand over her newly bruised eye speed down the street, her righteous, swaggering, red banana bedecked boyfriend a few menacing steps behind, and now I sense that it is truly time to go home. So I should have mentioned that took place in the Bronx. So the uh, Yankee Stadium being mentioned is, is actually the house that Big Ruth built that is now <laughs> no longer. <laughs> so a bit of history there too, now at this point, doesn't exist anymore. Um, I had a friend who's a poet who I'd like you all to know about, so I'm going to say his name. His name is Raul Sanchez, who has a great book called um, All Our Brown Skinned Angels. Send me a, I guess it was a note or a postcard where he was kind of down about his day job and about, you know, how it wasn't leaving him with a lot of energy or a lot of time to write. And so I, I wrote this poem to kind of encourage Raul, and I thought it would be a good way to, to say goodbye to the uh, National Unpublished Writers this evening, too. No weekends for poets for Raul Sanchez. Poets are on call 24-7, antenna outstretched, ears waiting for the next note, eyes scanning the landscape for signs of life. Shapeshifters, brave mask wearers, adventurers willing to risk heartbreak for humanity's sake. Don't let the man get you down. Your day job is a cover. I'm just going to wait for you now. <laughs> Thank you. Don't let the band get you down. Your day job is a cover to keep the snipers distracted as you destroy the capitalist nightmare from within. <laughs> Heroic singer, maker of songs, your poems will remain long after this social experiment has expired from its own pollution. You will prevail. No, thank you. So as I said, let's hear from uh, Richard Browdy and say goodbye. And I, I appreciate those of you who listened to the whole story that he read. This is about, I think, about a one minute recording of a poem that he's going to read. And if you're out there and you don't know who Richard Browdigan is, one of the reasons we have this event is we're hoping that you might go out and try to read something after. All right, let's see. So the poem is called Boo Forever from Pil The Pill versus The Spring Hill Mine Disaster. All of Browdigan's books have pretty great titles, too. Boo, forever. Spinning like a ghost on the bottom of a top, I'm haunted by all the space that I will live without you. I don't, I don't know exactly what they're called, but it's one of those um, devices where you can turn it and it kind of, yeah, John was explaining because he knew how. Yeah, so. Um, so also for the couple of you that came in late, the, this website that I'm looking at is browdigan.net. Uh, Professor John Barber, who started the day off for us today and who created National and Published Writers Day, created this incredibly detailed and comprehensive uh, website about Richard Browdigan. So if you don't know who he is and you'd like to check it out, or if you do know who he is and you'd like to see more, I've never seen anything connected to any writer on the planet that I can think of that is, is better constructed and you know more sort of user-friendly than this. So it's a great resource if you want to know more about the great writer Richard Browdigan. I want to thank the library, and I want to thank uh, Beth Wood, the Adult Services Librarian, who's now back with us for allowing us to do this. And although I'm inheriting this uh, event, uh, we're hoping that the library enjoyed us enough that we can continue to make it an annual event on the last weekend of January, because that is very close to Richard Browning's birthday. So we look forward to this. Uh, those of you who signed up for the newsletter or gave us emails, one of the things that 
we can do when we're communicating via emails. I'd love to hear feedback from people on the event and what they might like to see um, as we do this event in the future. And since it's once a year, uh, we've got plenty of time to kind of discuss what we might do differently or some of the things we just might like to add to the proceedings. So really um, grateful to everybody and um, thank you to Tony Partington for all the hard work she did today and to Tiffany Berbishram for uh, documenting it and I hope to see you next year, same time, same place. Thanks so much.